my mantra to do with the world is uh, to fuck it, to be focused, upbeat, curious and kind. If you're making great digital work, prove it. The call for entries for the Lovey Awards is open. Enter by the 5th of August at loveyawards.com. Presented by the Webbies, the Lovey Awards was founded to honour the best of the internet in Europe. Think ad campaigns, digital marketing, games, social, immersive experiences and podcasts like this one. Entering your work recognises the team and winning proves they're the best creative talent in Europe. Work is accepted across seven languages, English, French, German, Spanish, Italian, Dutch and Swedish. Join this symbol of the internet and creative excellence. Enter by the 5th of August at loveyawards.com. Hello and welcome to the shiny new object podcast. My name is Tom Ollerton. I'm the founder of Automated Creative and this is a weekly show where I get to interview really interesting folk from the marketing and advertising industries about their vision for the future of that industry. And this week is no different. I want to call my friend Barney Warfick-Smith, who is director at Megadog. So Barney, for anyone who doesn't know you in this industry, can you give them a bit of background about what you do and where you've been? Yeah, cool. Thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for having me. Right. So background, crikey, I suppose there's three main chapters to how I've ended up doing what I'm doing at the moment, which I'll go on to. Um, the, the, the short description of what I do now is that Megadog is a go-to-market consultancy that does thinking, planning and doing thereof, uh, which is quite a big grand thing and we can dive into that later. But yeah, I've been kind of lucky. Uh, I've been a salesperson throughout, I suppose, like we all do uh, in our different roles. But um, the first stage was media, um, working uh, supply side, selling to the media agencies. And then, <laughs> frankly, it all got a bit boring doing that. So whenever the uh, create the opportunity to be more creative sprang up, I, I got involved in doing that. So I ended up doing being head of creative solutions at Unruly, for example. Um, and that really sort of brought me into the second phase of what I've done, which was around creative and the business of creative, um, which I suppose the key pivotal moment in that was uh, that lot being um, a major shareholder and uh, one of the founding team of that lot, a social creative agency. And we built that and, and grew it and sold it uh, as social group. And that enabled me to do the third bit of my life, which is um, startups, really. I'd always found it very exciting, you know, all the, the youthful vigor and excitement and, and pivoting and all the other jazz that goes with it. So um, I, subsequent to the sale of that lot, I exited and put a bunch of money into a VC. Uh, so I had skin in the game and then became Megadog, which did go to market uh, thinking, planning and doing predominantly for scale ups, but I do it for a lot of other people as well. So that was how I got to where I am. So across all of those interesting jobs, roles, functions, and businesses, what new belief or behavior has really improved your work life in the last few years? Work life being so important, of course. This is a weird one. Up until probably after we'd sold the creative agency, I'd always followed my nose um, and never actually sat down and planned what I was going to do with my life at all, um, which I felt a bit silly about considering I think I was forty three at the time. And um, so I, I, I just saw something on LinkedIn that inspired me to start thinking about it. So I did a bit of Googling and um, ended up at a Mind Tools uh, website to do with personal goal setting. And um, I mean, you know me, Tom, I'm not necessarily this sort of guy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not some sort of West Coast 12 things to do to be a hustler before breakfast. And I'm not like a, a sort of tree hugging sort of hippie guy either. But I felt when I looked at all the stuff to do with personal goal setting, I realized that I'd been trying to do all this stuff, but I'd never really measured it or managed it or 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 been able to look at it in a more measured way. So I just made a, a big long list of all the stuff that was important to me to do with career, financial goals, uh, my continued education, family, things like the fact that 
artistic. I like taking a photo, um, giving back, charity work, etc. And yeah, I just made myself a big spider diagram that I check in on uh, every Monday morning and just go, right, have I neglected my family? Have I neglected my uh, some attitude, some facets of my attitude that I perhaps could do with changing? And um, yeah, that's been a pivotal change. I can't say I've stuck to it religiously, but just the act of measuring it and, and quantifying it has been a real game changer in how I approach work life. So what has been your top marketing tip that you've hoovered up over the years? You mentioned some very interesting and admirable businesses, but what is that bit of marketing advice that you find yourself relying on and sharing most often? It's a significant part of what I do. I can't really get away from the fact that while I worked at Unruly, um, we had a, a particularly amazing marketing machine, B2B marketing machine, um, working there under Sarah Wood, one of the founders, and I was part of it. And the basic, there wasn't so much a tip, it was a modus operandi, which was whenever we were fashioning stories to tell to market, to generally make ourselves visible, um, we made everything um, recognizable and repeatable. And if possible, uh, sound biteable, the type of thing that if it was said on stage or within an article, it's the t- journal is always hungry for something to, to share and to type. And it's just give them exactly what they want. So an example of that might have been when there was some more early conversation about um, ad blocking. Uh, we just leapt on this and th- there was a talk that Sarah gave called the hashtag ad apocalypse. And just, um, so we basically gave stuff a name and I suppose now I look back and I do employ this tactic quite a lot. The virtue of that is that if you give something a repeatable name, you're just giving it fuel to travel further by itself, uh, without having to rely on the business of actually pushing it a bit further. So recognizable and repeatable, if possible, sound biteable. Wow, that is that is really good beat to be marketing. I'll have to make note of that for myself and all automated <laughs> creative. That's fantastic. And and unruly, but you know, what a success they made of that. So the proof is mm. certainly in that pudding. This episode of the Shiny New Object podcast is brought to you in partnership with Manfest. Whether it's live in London or streamed online to the global marketing community, you can always expect a distinctive and daring blend of fast-paced content, startup innovation pitches, and unconventional entertainment from Madfest events. You'll find me causing trouble on stage, recording live versions of this podcast, and sharing a beer with the nicest and most influential people in marketing. Check it out at www.madfestlondon.com. We're now going to go to your shiny new object, which is kind of embarrassingly your your business, or um, but that's fine. Yeah, it's not um, a sales pitch. But, <laughs> it's not a sales pitch. <laughs> but your shiny new object is go to market thinking, planning, and doing. And here we go. I've already I've already made that repeatable. What you said at the start of the show. So you're you're applying your tip to your own shiny new object. Very 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 good. So I was chatting to you the other day, and I said, "What well, what is go to market?" It sort of makes sense, but can you just explain it to someone who has no idea or just pretends to know what that means? Well, everybody's pretending, and that is the problem. So I was sort of repurposing Megadog a little bit. I used to refer to it as growth in communications. And I was going out, I went through a phase of talking to lots of current clients and potential new clients. And um, this go-to-market thing kept coming up and people were confused as all hell. And and I I started Googling go-to-market strategy, go-to-market template, go-to-market this. And literally every single definition I found was different. Um, And that's incredibly unhelpful when, let's say, I specifically work around scale-ups, but go-to-market can apply to a repositioning or it can apply to a big company that's that's launching a new product. And that's incredibly unhelpful when the actual ultimate measure of success is that thing, you know, people buying that product or service. And if there isn't a clear definition of what go-to-market actually means. So, um, the reason why I've called it thinking, planning, and doing is that I am in the process of trying to put together a, a much more kind of measured and structured way of thinking about the go-to-market process. 
So yeah, does that answer the question? The initial. But what? But what is the what? So even go back one layer. What is the go-to-market process? Is that is that? So you're talking about scale up. Who is I don't know what fifty to one hundred and fifty people or ten to twenty, and you want them to go to the next level. And go go to market is how you show up in your comms. No, so this is the way I think of it. There are misconceptions. You know the 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 tale of the blind melon, the elephant. You know, just everyone blind man who goes up and grabs either the tail or the tusk or the leg has a different interpretation of what it means. And this is the problem with go to market. So the reason I've split it into think, plan and do is I believe they're all integral parts to the success. And by being siloed, it, it, it inherently reduces the, the potential for success. So think. So let's say, for example, you've got a CEO and in the early days of the setup of the business, they've thought about uh, the mission, vision, values. They've obsessed over the problem, as all good startup founders should. And they've got a really clear idea in their mind as to how they should turn up in market and what the core things are that make their product or service viable and valuable. Great. That's cool. Then a while later, what will happen is that let's say they've raised, they've got some money and they start to invest in marketing and the marketing job will get, let's say, drop kicked over to the chief product officer, the the product person, because the CEO is busy off going, raising more money and their interpretation of it. They might suddenly Google go to market and go, crikey, I need just, I need just to flog some stuff and they'll get sucked into um, a marketing automation wormhole and perhaps might not be that subtle in their marketing thinking. They might start focusing on product features rather than thinking about the problems it's solving for their potential customers. And then the doing bit, let's say it's a little while later, they've got some salespeople who are going out to market and they're just operating in a silo again. They're just just like salespeople do, making it up as they go along and finding what works and then just following their nose on that. And all of a sudden, you've got one part of go-to-market, which is the thinking, um, which needs to be there for a successful company, which is divorced and in a silo from the execution of the marketing, which might be uh, targeted and messaging in a slightly different way. And then you might have uh, an account-based sales team, for example, going out and again, not being linked up with marketing. So that's the challenge that I've found is that these things are not linked up and well, if they are, and if there's people to oversee that, and within a business, if someone takes responsibility for overlooking seeing that in a long term fashion, that's where success lies. What are the first points of remedy? So, a lot of founders listen to this show. So, what would you be saying to them? Like, they may recognise the that problem that you've just identified, but what are the what are the first steps in solving that? So, <laughs> I the other day I listed out all of the things that I could think of that potentially are should be within or could be within a go to market plan, and there's 22 that I've got at the moment, but I think there might be more. And the earlier phases of that, the thinking piece, is to do with getting your mission, vision, and values sorted out, and in reality. The problem definition and the value proposition, they should really understand that themselves. But I can help with that because I do that sort of stuff. Um, So it's really about, I've I've been calling this, Tom, the special source, this first bit, which is an awful marketing phrase. And I'm sorry, but it really is. It's about looking at you as a business. What have you got? What is your competitive advantage that you can talk about that differentiates you. So it's that first part. And I find as a rule that comes out of mission, vision, and values, and the stuff that you need to be saying repeatedly and recognizably to market on an ongoing basis. So I'm halfway through, I think, ish, the the Pixar book. I can't remember what it's, can't remember what it's called, but uh, yeah, the guy who set up and ran and sold Pixar at Disney. And he's uh, very, well, there's a whole chapter on randomness. Uh, it's called Creativity Inc. There you go. It's, a, it's a, a good listen. And he's one of the things that he talks about is that when something goes well, uh, we have like so hindsight isn't 2020 is, is his point that like, you know, we attribute success to all the wrong things, like usually our decision making or our action. Whereas in actual fact, there's um, our perception of the world is, is very limited and we don't read, you know, it's 
it's very difficult for me to see the world from someone else's perspective as they see it. You can imagine elements of it. But ultimately, he said all of Pixar's success was about, was based on lots of sort of happy accidents, really. Yeah, they work really hard. They're really talented, had a vision, mission and purpose and all the things that you mentioned. But how do you plan for random shit that just gets in the way? How do you plan for random shit? <laughs> I suppose agility, I mean, startup scale-ups have agility built in more than um, other types of customers and clients that you might work with because it's just the nature of the game. Um, I suppose there's two things there. It's about how do you perhaps create random brilliance and how do you overcome it? In terms of creating random brilliance, I think it's a case of just being open to turning up in a slightly different way um, and then avoiding random problems. <sighs> I don't really know. I'm not sure, mate. I mean, this is the problem with randomness. You pose me a really difficult question. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't, I don't, just um, been for a run and he, and he posed that question. I was like, oh, right, I can, I can ask, ask Barney about that. You know what? I'm going to come back to that one, Tom. I'm, uh, there's, there's a better answer there. Um, there is. Okay. So, yeah. um, so, so a different one. So we talked a bit about, you know, how, how to get started. What, um, but what are the, like the key things to avoid, you know, what, when you meet a new client and they say, oh, we, you know, we're struggling with X, Y, Z, what are those kind of face palm moments where you're like, oh, not another one. What's, what's the common error? Um, the, the worst error that I think people make with regards to go to market is, just falling down a rabbit hole of one of the particular interpretations of what it is. Um, they might become fixated with partnerships or they might think that the only actual answer is to get a bunch of salespeople or the only answer. And this is actually predominant one that I see is to build a, a lead engine and just rinse uh, digital communications. And it's, 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 yeah, it's focusing on one part of what go to market is rather than looking at it holistically. And then the other thing is, you know, you talk about like purpose, mission and vision. I know you probably work for agencies and organizations where they go, right, we're going to have a purpose, mission and vision session. And like yeah. a small part of you always dies. How do you not do that with that kind of like small death going on in the background? It's really interesting. Um, here's hot new news for you. Well, I'm just about to launch a little partnership with um, one of my old clients called Grounded World, uh, who are based over in the US. And they are uh, uh, the real deal in terms of, uh, they mirror a lot of what I do, but working with um, organizations that want to align purpose and profit. Their first client was the UN, so they're the real deal. They're not talking bullshit. Um, so, where purpose comes into the equation when I'm dealing with clients, uh, it has to actually mean that. Um, I, I'm not greenwashing or, or green hushing, as I've heard as another phrase recently, just, just won't cut it. That, that, you know, my job is to try and help companies find their special source. And if they're you know, making it up, saying that it's something that it's not, that's clearly visible um, to the customers. So it has to actually mean something. And by that, I mean, um, it needs to either the entire raison d'etre of what they're doing needs to be purpose-led, or they need to look back at their entire supply chain and the way that they do things to ensure that it's not just a badge that says, yeah, we care about the environment or we care about you know, homeless people or, or whatever else it might be. It needs to be real. So unfortunately, Barney, we are at the end of the podcast. So I've no doubt the people will want to get in touch with you. Where is the best place for that? And what makes a killer outreach to you? Oh, right. Well, the best place to get a hold of me is, as you know, I mean, you're the one that's totally present uh, across social. I told you I was going to get that in. Um, uh, but you'll find me on um, Twitter tweeting a lot about a load of these subjects at Mighty Barnsky, Barney at mega.dog is where you'll find me in mega.dog is my site where there's lots of other information. Um, what makes killer outreach? Is this, is this to me or is this to other people? No, to you. So if someone wants to well, I work for you, give you some work, what, what are you looking for? And what's a great email look like to you? Well, in my 
my mantra to do with the world is uh, to 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 fuck it, to be focused, upbeat, curious, and kind. And so, if you can give me an email that uh, has at least two of those elements, then I would love to work with you. Wow, that. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to finish it Bonnie thank you so much for your time that's my pleasure Tom thank you hi just before you go I'd really appreciate it if you could take the time to write a review of the shiny new object podcast on Apple Podcasts or iTunes whatever it's called these days or whichever podcast provider you use we're an indie podcast so it would go a long way for us if you could just share the word and give us a bit of a support on those channels that would just be fantastic if you haven't got time that's also cool and yeah if you could tell your colleagues about the podcast and also if possible don't forget to subscribe and I'd love to hear your feedback uh, uh, if you'd like to speak on the podcast or be a guest or you think I'm asking the wrong questions, anything, I'd be super interested to hear what you think. So please email me at tom at automatedcreative.net. That's T-O-M at, uh, I'm not going to bother spelling it. Anyway, you'll work it out. Thanks so much.